Yeah, namaste and good morning, everyone. Today is uh, Tuesday. So let's start our Udhav Gita, where we left off last time. And uh, But before that, let's do some prayers. Om Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Maheshwaraha, Guru Sakshat Parbrahma, Tasmei Shri Guru Venamaha, Om Bhur Bhavaswa, Tatsa Vitra Vare Neyam, Bargo Deva Sedhi Mahi, Diyo Yonaha Prachodaya, Asto Ma Sadhamya, Tamso Ma Jyotir Gamya, Mrityur Ma Amritam Gamya, Om Sehna Vavtu, Sehna Bhunaktu, Seviriyam Karvavai, Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastu, Ma Vidvi Shavahi, Om Shanti 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 Om. Let's open our books. Eh? We all have the same book. And we are reading from this. And today we are going to start eh, with verse number 21. And this is a, uh, chapter number 1 and page number 27. So verse number 21. Purushutve cha maam dhiraha, sankhya yoga visharadaha, avistaram prapashyanti sarvashaktihe upabrihitam. Those who are expert in the science of sankhya yoga and are self-controlled can directly see me along with all my potencies. So who is saying that? Lord Vishnu. To whom? To Uddhava. So commentary written according to this author is that many among such human beings can realize me. That means God. Those who are sober and non-envious can certainly understand me. So that means people who have some divine qualities. So sure we all desire to see God. But do we deserve to see God? Okay, we get what we deserve, not what we desire. So these qualities need to be cultivated. Those who know Sankhya Yoga and Bhakti Yoga can also realize me. And we are all familiar with Bhakti Yoga. There is a whole chapter in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 12, Bhakti Yoga. Lord Krishna gave Several qualities over there to be cultivated by us. About 36 qualities. So if we want to see God, work on those qualities. Then we'll be deserving also. It is stated in the Shruti, persuasive chavistram atma sahitaha pragyanen sampanaha tamo Vigyanatam vadati, vigyanatam pashyati, vedaha, shvastanam, vedaha, lokala, lokau, mratendriyantram iptehe evam sampanah, dreshtam, pashunam asan vipasehe eva vigyanam. This means the human form of life is endowed with sufficient intelligence. So that one can imbibe transcendental knowledge. So that means our buddhi is a human intellect is to that level where we can cultivate these qualities. While in the human form of life, one can speak about his realization, see the truth of material existence, understand the future consequences of his actions, and thus appreciate the existence not only of this world, but also the next this is how much capability we have. By experiencing the futility of material existence, the soul in the human form can inquire about immortality. This is the purpose of human life because the human body can enable one to achieve perfection. When a human being becomes advanced by spiritual practice, he will see the futility of the activities of the animals which are simply eating, sleeping, mating and defending because these are the only four things human animals do humans 
as humans we have a higher intelligence we can know the purpose of life self realization people who are maddened by material enjoyment consider all visible articles as the objects of their temporary sense enjoyment they consider the supreme lord to be impotent and thus deny his existence but those steady and thoughtful people who have mastered the science of self self realization and devotional service realize that the all powerful supreme lord is present in every object okay verse number 22 ek dvi tri chatus pado bahu padas tatha pada bahvya sante pura srishtas tasam me porushi priya in this material world there are varieties of created bodies some with one leg others with two legs three legs four legs many legs and still others with no legs among all such bodies the human form is very dear to me because it awards one the ultimate goal of life so lord is glorifying the human body by saying all this according to their karma the conditioned soul receive different types of bodies because they are materially conditioned they accept their material body to be their self among all such bodies the human form is dear to the supreme lord because only in the human form is one capable of achieving the ultimate goal of life only as human beings sir we can understand it we can do the sadhana no other form can do it so we should not let this form go to waste where we have a higher intelligence so lord krishna is saying it still number 23 अत्र अधायुक्त हेतु भिर ईश्वरं गृह मानेर गुनेर लिंगेर अग्राह्यम अनुमानतः अल्दो माय फॉर्म इज नॉट डायरेक्टली सीन बाय ऑर्डिनरी सेंस परसेप्शन ओके वी कैन नॉट सी इट विद दिस आईज ऑर्डिनरी आईज ऑर्डिनरी इयर्स वी कैन नॉट हियर हिम so although my form is not directly seen by ordinary sense perception those are situated in human life may use their intelligence and other faculties of perception to directly search for me through both apparent and indirectly ascertained symptoms the living entities who have received human forms can directly search for me this is god is saying the supreme controller of all the devotees worship me by the process of a devotional service beginning with hearing and chanting i have already stated that i am known only through devotional service now the question may arise that since the lord is the source of everything including the intelligence how can one realize him through sense perception and mental speculation the answer is that guesswork undertaken by use of intelligence is unacceptable by such guesswork the dependent living entity tries to reach a conclusion but the independent super soul is not fully realized by such a process the supreme lord krishna is beyond the reach of dry arguments his forms qualities past times and opulence are all inconceivable therefore he is not realized through indirect sense perception only human beings can realize the existence of the supreme lord with the help of direct and indirect perception after seeing cause and effect temporary and permanent nature and the external and internal causes in this material world so not just the speculation not about arguing but through proper practice 
still Lord Krishna is talking. Atrapyehe Udaharintam Riti Hasam Puratanam Avadhutasya Samvadam Udor Amit Tej Saha. So Lord Krishna is saying, now I will relate to you a historical narration concerning a conversation between the greatly powerful king Yadu and a most intelligent Avadhuta. So he is saying that now I will relate to you an ancient conversation that took place between an Avdhut and a king Yadu, which will shed light on your understanding of the super soul. And super soul is what? God. Avdhutam dviyam kanchich charantam akutobhayam Kavim nirikshahe tarunam yadu paprach dharam vivit. Once upon a time, Maharaj Yadu, who himself was most learned in spiritual science, saw an avdhut Brahman who appeared to be young and wise, wandering about fearlessly. Maharaj Yadu took the opportunity and inquired from the Brahman as follows. So what did the Yadu Maharaj said to that Avdhut? He said, Kutoho buddhir iyam Brahman akartu su visharadaha yam asadhye bhaval lokam vidvans charati balvat King Yadu said, O Brahman, I can see that you are not practicing any kind of spiritual discipline. And yet you have gained perfect understanding of everything and everyone within this world. Kindly tell me how you developed your extraordinary intelligence. Why do you wander over the earth behaving as if you were a mere Child, Balwat. And in the next verse, Yadu Maharaj is still speaking to that Brahman. Prayo dharamarth kameshu vivistayam cha manvaha hetuna eva samihant ayusho yashasa shriya. He says, people in this world often cultivate religiosity. That means uh, the Karamkanda. That outwardly they look very religious. Economic development. Uh, that means enhancement uh, in materialism. Uh, and the sense gratification. And also the science of uh, self-realization. And their usual motive is to achieve a long duration of life. <clears throat> acquire fame and enjoy material opulence. So although they desire to know about religiosity, economic development, sense gratification and the self, people in general think that these will benefit them with a long duration of life and so on. Tvam tu kalpaha kavir dakshaha su bhago amrit bhashnaha na karta nehase kinchich jadon mataha pishachvat. Although you are able, wise, expert, handsome, and a sweet speaker, you are not engaged in doing anything. Rather, you appear to be acting like an inert madman as if you are a ghostly creature. Yadu, the son of Yayati, is saying, you are not the performer of any action and you do not want anything. It is not that you are not doing anything because of ignorance. You are capable. It's not that you lack expertise. You are expert in all activities 
it's not that you are ugly and hence you do not wish to associate with a woman. You are handsome. You speak less. It's not that you are not a learned person, but you do not wish to converse with anyone. Oh, Brahman, despite all these, why are you behaving like a dumb person or like a ghost? So this is uh, Yadu Maharaj, the King Yadu, ancestors of Lord Krishna, because he was a Yadu Vanshi. So he is asking that uh, Brahman. And in the next verse, what he says, Janeshuhu, Dahema Neshuhu, Kam Log, the Vagna, Na Tapya Se Agni Mukto, Ganga Ambha, Satha, Ivudvipa. Although human beings in this world are burning in the forest fire of lust and greed, you remain free and are not burned by that fire. You appear to be like a peaceful elephant in the midst of the water of the cooling Ganga. So he's saying you are young and still you are not afflicted by lusty desires. What is the reason behind this? People in this world are always suffering from lust, greed and so on. However, you are free from such suffering and thus appear to be like an elephant standing in the water of Ganga. There is abundance of water in the Ganga. The water of the Ganga can extinguish any fire. As the waves of the Ganga can extinguish the fire of lust, of an intoxicated elephant and make him peaceful. Although human beings in this world are always disturbed by enemies, such as lust, you are an avdhut. And because you are not overwhelmed by lusty desires, you are not disturbed by the fire of lust, like an elephant situated in the water. Then he says, verse number 30, Janeshuhu, Dehimaneshuhu, Kaam Lob, Dvagna, Na Tapya Se Agni Muktoho, Ganga Ambha, Satha Iv Dvipa. That was 29. We just did 30. Tvam Hina Prichitam Brahman, Atman Nehe Anand Karanam, Bruhi sparash vihinasye bhavtaha keval atmanaha. So Yadu Maharaj says, O oh great Brahman, I see that you are devoid of any contact with material enjoyment and that you are traveling alone without any companions or wife or children. Therefore, because I am sincerely inquiring from you, Please tell me the cause of the great ecstasy that you feel within yourself. That means where is this ecstasy coming from, this peace coming from? So according to the logic that one who has a mouth will speak, I wish to know from where you are getting this unlimited happiness. You are completely aloof from sense enjoyments. But still you are receiving so much happiness. Because we ordinary people think that happiness comes from the sensuality, from the materialism. But you are totally detached from it and you are still so happy. Where is it coming from? The sense objects, form, taste, smell, sound and touch cannot attack those liberated souls who are fully engaged in the devotional service of the Supreme Lord and who are freed from the desire for material enjoyment. Those who are attached to material form, taste and so on become entangled by the affection of their wife and children. You are an avdhut. And so I want to know why you are experiencing transcendental bliss even though you are not intoxicated by worldly happiness. 
So now Lord Krishna says to Uddhava, he says in verse number 31, Yadu na evam mahabhago brahmniena su medhna prishtaha sa bhajita praha prashna yavana tamutvicha. The Supreme Lord said, when the Avadhut Brahman was thus respected and spoken to in this way by the intelligent King Yadu. Why intelligent King Yadu? To even appreciate the goodness, the ecstasy. You need the intelligence. So that's why Lord Krishna is calling him that intelligent king Yadu, who was the benefactor of Brahman, sir, being pleased with the king's respectful attitude, he began to humbly reply. Because King Yadu was asking the question, and questions were asked respectfully and intelligently. So, of course, the Brahman is going to give the secret of his happiness. Why is he? in this ecstasy. So the Supreme Lord said, O most fortunate Uddhav, when the wise king Yadu pleased the Avdhut by his service, he began to speak as follows. So now that Brahman is talking. Okay. Verse number 32. Santihi me gurvoho rajan Bahavo buddhye upashrita, yato buddhim upadai, mukto tamih tan shrinu. The Avdud Brahman said, My dear king, I have received knowledge from the many spiritual masters who are present in this world. It is because of this that I am able to freely wander about in this world. Now, please hear as I describe these spiritual masters to you. So he says, I have learned from others. And then I practiced. Oh, King, I have many spiritual masters who I choose with the help of my intelligence. So that means you, we need the buddhi to even accept a teacher. Although I did not formally receive instructions from them, I have accumulated much knowledge by observing them with the help of my intelligence. In this way, I have become free from the miseries of material existence and I am wandering about freely in this world. Now let me tell you the names of these spiritual masters. Those who are averse to Krishna and who are full of Anarats are always busy lording it over material objects. That means who do not see the divinity, they don't have a devotional attitude, they just think that this Maya will give them the happiness. They spend their days accomplishing the three objectives of life, religiosity, economic development and sense gratification. Their only aim is to enhance their duration of life as well as their glories and beauty. Because of Dhut Mahashe did not display any such behavior, King Yadu asked him the reason for his wandering about in this way. In reply, the Avdhut said, rather than accepting these 24 entities that are observed within this visible world as the means of my enjoyment, I have accepted them as my instructing spiritual masters. Giving up the conception of accepting something and rejecting something else. So let go of the negative and accept the positive. We can always see that in any situation with any object also. I do not live like an ordinary human being who is driven by mental speculation and thus bereft of the service of a spiritual master. I travel in this world. 
under the shelter of my fixed intelligence. With a desire to surpass all anarats and to always render loving service to the Supreme Lord. I have taken shelter of these 24 spiritual masters. And in the next three verses, he is giving the list of those. So verse number 33, 34, 35, this is the list. Prithvi, Vayur, Akasham, Apo, Agnim, Chandram, Ravi, Kapotoho, Ajgaraha, Sindhu, Patango, Madhukar, Gaja, Madhuha, Harinoho, Meenaha, Pingla, Kururo, Abharkaha, Kumari, Sharkrit, Sarp, Urnabhi, Supeshkrit, Ete, Megurvo, Rajan, Chatur, Vimshatir, Ashritaha, Shiksha, Vritibhir, Ete, Sham, Anva Shiksham Ihi Atmanaha. So this was verse number 33, 34, and 35. O King, I have taken shelter of the following 24 things as my spiritual masters. The earth, Prithvi, air, Vayu, sky, water, fire, Moon, sun, a pigeon, a python, the sea, a moth, a honey bee, an elephant, a honey thief, deer, fish, the prostitute pingla, the kurur bird, a child, a young girl, an arrow maker, a serpent, a spider, and a wasp. See, some of these things, we have seen them too in life. What did we learn? My dear king, by studying their activities, I have learned the science of the self. See, with the higher intelligence, we can always learn from these objects also, people also, situations also. The ancient rishis, the yogis, so the whole, even hot yoga practice is based upon observing the animals. We have a murasana, kukutasana, padavasana. See, most of the asana, sarapasana, ushtrasana, different pranayams, different mudras. Those yogis, they pay attention. They accept what is good for them. And this is what the Savadhut is saying, that these are all my teachers. I have learned from all this. So he says, the earth, air, sky, water, fire, the moon, the sun, a pigeon, a python, the sea, a moth, a honeybee, an elephant, a hunter who steals money, deer, fish, the prostitute named Pingla. A kural bird, a child, a young girl, an arrow maker, a serpent, a spider, and a wasp. I have learned many things from the behavior of these 24 things. And next week we'll see when we start with verse number 36. He's going to explain to us that what he has learned from each one of them. So from these verses or this dialogue, we got to remember that we got to cultivate devotional attitude also. Do we spend some time cultivating this devotion or not? Because a devotion is a quiet time that you spend praying, reading scriptures, reflecting on their relationship with God. What he is to me, that's a devotion. You can choose to sing a bhajan, meditate, or even write during your devotional time. But out of 
24 hours a day, there should be a significant amount of devotional time allotted there. If we want to increase our devotion towards God. The general purpose of a devotional life is to encourage spiritual growth. Spiritual growth means identifying yourself with the spirit who you are. Not the maya, but the spirit, spiritual. Our saintly people, they have given us different ways to cultivate this devotion. They say, Shravana, Kirtana, Smarana, Pad, Sevaha, Archanaha, Vandana, Dase, Sake, Atam, Nivedana. I'm sure you are familiar with this eight forms of devotion. Whatever suits your personality. But then remember, there are two types of devotions. One is called conditional, the other one is called unconditional. Conditional is bound by area and time. And that is within the limits of the certain area. You honor God. When you go to the temple or when you're own, in your own home, in the temple room, you visualize God, you talk to God, you remember God. But ultimately, we got to increase our conditional devotion to the unconditional devotion, which is not conditioned by time or place. No matter where you are, never forgetting God. Sure, in the beginning, we cannot do that. That's why our rishis, they said, do devote some time. But then ultimately, see God everywhere, all the time. But how to show devotion to God? That's also a question I hear from many people. The first thing we need to do is start our day with God. The very first thing in the morning. Before saying good morning to other people, Start your day remembering him, thanking him. Doesn't have to be a full-fledged prayer, but at least in your mind. That's why it really helps to have some kind of a picture or a some form of God near your bed. Then when we pray, we should pray intentionally. Write down the things you are thankful for. Few years ago, I did puja at somebody's house, and that young lady she gave a jars to everybody, all her friends, beautiful jars, and a stack of cards. She said, every day, write down something you are grateful for. Sooner or later, you see that whole jar is full of the gratitudes. Every day, when you look at it. You are grateful. We can start a journal or we can have a jar like that. And why beautiful jar? Because we are always attracted to beautiful things. Notice your complaints. Turn them into praise. Enjoy God's creation. Love others and love yourself. This way we can show devotion to God because who has created all? He did. If we are saying that uh, God, or we keep on complaining that my nose is this way, ears are this way or anything else, we are complaining to God. Instead of that, praise God. That's love. And we saw in Bhagavad Gita, 
the 12th chapter bhakti yoga highest form of devotion bhakti yoga when we cultivate those qualities what is the power of this devotion why lord krishna talked about it why <clears throat> rishi vyas did not feel completed even after writing all the scriptures until he wrote this bhagavat puran which is full of devotion because the devotion has the power to reduce our egocentric self preoccupation and it fosters a sense of humility because when we understand that the divine resides within all of us we remember we are not better than any one else that's what devotion does to us devotion simply means your involvement with life is absolute that even you don't matter anymore your involvement with what you have taken up is so absolute that who you are does not matter then you are a devotee in other words devotion means you are devoid of yourself then it's a devotion devotion also means full of care full of hope and most of all love you can define devotion this way too devotion is equal to one person one portion of endurance because devotee is highly endured one portion of tenacity also one portion of patience also but remember the largest portion is the love but the rest of the ingredients got to be there too if they are not there this love is not love to that highest level devotion is doing even when you don't feel like it like in the morning you don't want to get up but still you do it because you love god so much that you want to get up and say hello to god namaskar to god thank you to god just like we did as mothers we didn't want to get up middle of the night to change the diapers or to feed but still we did it what made us do that love for our children the helpless baby so let me say it again devotion is doing even when you don't feel like it sanskrit word for devotion is bhakti so devotion is a stronger form of love so last week uh, urmil is the one who asked me to just say a few words about devotion because we read this word again and again and again unless we change our attitude unless we live a life of a devotee this will be just another scripture another beautiful reading we are going through we want to make sure that these readings this whether we are enjoying the sanskrit part or whether we are enjoying the translation or the commentary or purport we got to see is it washing us or not is our identification with the ego it is being sublimated or not we got to look at that do we feel the oneness with others or not can we forgive 
can we learn from the other's mistakes or our mistakes or can we learn from all this whatever we are here with see just like this avadhut is saying i learned from these 24 teachers what to accept what to reject in our teachers also we just try to find faults that means we are paying more attention in the faults but over here this great avadhut he could reach to that level of ecstasy because he learned and we will see what he has learned he did not judge the bee he did not judge the prostitute he did not judge the bee wasp or even the thief of honey he learned from all those so i would like you to just make a note of it write down all these 24 names of the teachers and then next week or next few weeks when we see what he has learned can we learn or can we look at it what we have learned so far from different teachers so we are ending this class today with this verse number 35 so let's stop it here with the shanti part and uh, uh, with some bhajans okay thank you very much om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaye purnameva avishesyate om shanti 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 om before we start the bhajan i like to say thank you thank you